Hello, I greet you, and I greet you in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As a priest, and especially as a director and leader of youths, St. John Bosco wanted to point out the spiritual perils, dangers in our spiritual life, wanted to point out the spiritual perils that may be encountered by youths in general, and seminarians in particular. He said that youths are anxious to do what is right, but do not know how to go about it. He gave them pieces of advice as a father gives to his son, as a father gives to his children. He encouraged them in their daily struggle against the promptings of emotions and urged them to strive after perfection through humility and obedience. He exhorted them to be faithful to God and do God's will for them continuously. The following script was left to us by Don Bosco. It reads, Summer usually presents serious dangers for seminarians, especially if the summer holidays are protracted, as was the case then, when they lasted from the Feast of St. John the Baptist to All Saints Day, that is, four and a half months, summer holidays, four and a half months, too long. As you well know, the Feast of St. John the Baptist falls on the 24th of June, while the Feast of All Saints' Day falls on the 1st of November. Don Bosco continued. He wrote, In my holidays I spent my time reading and writing, but since I didn't know how to organize my time, I wasted a good deal of it. I tried to spend some time doing manual work. I made spindles, pegs, children's toys, and bowls, meaning bocce. I mended clothes and shoes, and repaired fittings and furniture. I also did some masonry work and bound books. At home I still have a desk, a kitchen table, and some chairs I made that summer. I can call them my masterpieces. I also harvested, pruned, gathered grapes and made wine. I had already done that work in previous summers before entering the seminary. I also took care of the usual group of boys, but I could do that only on Sundays and days of obligation. I would gather them at home, in my yard, in the evening and after a few games, I would give them a brief talk. I enjoy teaching catechism to them, who were already 16 years old and still knew nothing about religion. I also taught some of them to read and write with good results. The great desire they had to learn drew boys of all ages to me. The lessons were free of charge, but I demanded it regularity attention and monthly confession. At the beginning, a few of them dropped out because they were unwilling to accept these conditions. Their dropout was also a blessing for those who remained. When I said that holidays are dangerous, I was speaking for myself. A seminarian may find himself in a serious danger without even being aware of it. This happened to me. And Don Bosco continued to write, Once, on a village feast day, an uncle of mine invited me to his house for a banquet. I didn't want to go, but he insisted because I was needed for the church services. So I accepted, served mass, and helped out with the singing. Then the banquet started. Things went well, but only for a while, because as soon as the guests began to feel the effects of the wine, they started to talk rather freely. 
as a seminarian, I would not stand for that. I tried to complain, but in vain. So I got up from the table, took my hat, and was ready to leave. My uncle objected to my leaving and would not let me go. There and then someone else began to talk even more offensively and insulted the others at table. Things went from bad to worse. There were shouts and threats. There was nothing else to do but get out of there as fast as possible. When I got home, I firmly renewed the resolution I had made I had already made, namely to keep away from worldly activities, to avoid falling into sin. I had another similar case of an occasion of sin in another place. Another uncle of mine this time, whose name was Matthew, invited me for the feast of St. Bartholomeus. Again, I was to help at the church services, sing and play the violin. This had been my favorite instrument, but I had already given it up. Everything went well in church. The dinner was at my uncle's house, since he was the chairman of the festivities. So far, so good. The parish priest also was at table with us. After dinner, the guests asked me if I would play something for them, but I didn't want to. They insisted, saying that they simply desired to hear me playing the violin. I told them I had left my violin at home. No problem, one of the guests promptly replied. We can easily get you one. I get it and then you will play. In no time he was back with it. I still tried to get out of it. Fool that I was, I didn't have the courage to refuse. So I began playing the violin and continued for quite a while. Suddenly I heard whispering and shuffling of feet as though many people had gathered. I went to the window and saw a crowd dancing gaily in the front yard to the sound of my music. I have no words to describe the great distress I felt on seeing the people dancing to my music. What? I cried to the assembled guests, do you expect me to promote this kind of entertainment after I have spoken so often against it? Never. Here, take the violin at once, back to its owner, thank him and tell him I don't need it any longer. I then got up and went home. At home, I took my violin, trampled on it and smashed it into a thousand pieces. Never again did I play such an instrument, not even at church services. I had made a solemn promise and I kept it. Later, I taught others how to play it, but without ever handling it myself. Don Bosco continued narrating. I can mention another episode. In summer, I went hunting for bears' nests. In autumn, I would set snares with bird lime and cages, and sometimes I hunted with a gun. One day I was chasing a hare from one field to another, and from vineyard to vineyard. I climbed hills and roamed through valleys for hours. Finally I caught up with the poor animal. My shot broke its limbs, and the poor thing fell on the spot. I was filled with deepest sorrow. Some friends of mine came running at the sound of the shot. While they gloated over the kill, I cast a glance at myself and noticed that, dressed as I was, without cassock, in shirt sleeves, with a coarse straw hat, and over two kilometers away from home, I looked just like a poacher. I felt very embarrassed. So I apologized for my appearance and returned home quickly. I once again gave up hunting in any form, and this time, with the help of the Lord, I kept my promise. May God forgive me for such behavior. These three episodes really taught me a lesson. From that time on, I strongly decided to lead a life away from worldly pursuits, I became firmly convinced 
that anyone wishing to devote himself truly to God's service must give up all worldly amusements. True, such amusements are often not sinful, but one thing is certain, worldly dress, speech and behavior are always a danger to virtue, especially the delicate virtue of chastity. Very different was the opinion of those who knew him at that time. The vice parish priest, Don Ropolo, stated, during the summer holidays, the seminarian and cleric Giovanni Bosco took every possible precaution to safeguard the spirit of the seminary. At home, he kept himself constantly busy, studying and doing some manual work, which was good for his health. These activities were necessary. He was never idle. Moreover, he faithfully carried out all the practices of piety proper to a seminarian. Meditation, spiritual reading, the rosary, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, daily attendance at Mass and frequent communion. Since he lived far from the parish church, he was not always able to attend the early Mass because of his poor state of health and other reasons as well. So he would come to the last Mass at 11 o'clock, at which he received Holy Communion, to the great edification of all people. He was always willing to serve at the altar. Every Sunday he zealously taught catechism to youths. Whenever the church bells tolled for the dying, he immediately hurried off for church, some two kilometers away, where he would put on a surplice, take the ombrellino and escort the Blessed Sacrament to the home of the sick person, no matter how far. Nor did he consider himself excused from listening to sermons. Rather, he was so attentive that afterwards he could repeat them word for word to his fellow seminarians, to their utter amazement. His behavior was always exemplary, whenever and wherever he found himself, because he knew how important it was to do good to others. Consequently, his fellow villagers held him in great esteem. Giovanni Bosco spent a good deal of his time with Don Cinzano, who loved him dearly. At the same time, all the books in the parish priest's library were at his disposal. The good priest was well versed in philosophy, theology and history and maintained a lively interest in the study of literature. As a Latin scholar, he had all the classics which he constantly read and studied, even at his advanced age. This wise priest had a very high opinion of Giovanni Bosco, often remarking that ever since he had known him, he had always noticed something extraordinary in him. A thing that greatly contributed to this reputation was Giovanni's great self-control. Giovanni Filippello, a great friend of Giovanni Bosco, recalled that one day Giovanni Bosco was waiting in the presbytery reception room to speak to the parish priest. There were also some people waiting, among them two students who had come to get some documents from the parish priest. These two students began to mock Giovanni Bosco. Someone urged Giovanni to put those two blockheads in their place, but Giovanni replied, let them have their fun. They are young, and besides, their laughter does me no harm. Professor Francesco Bertania gave us this report. When Giovanni was at home in Susambrino, several times a week, about six young students of Castelnuovo would go to him for private lessons, either together or separately, and at different hours. Some needed tutoring in the subjects they had studied the year before, while others needed to prepare themselves for the course to which they had been promoted. 
A few parents paid a small monthly fee, which enabled Giovanni to buy clothes for himself. Other parents gave nothing, and Giovanni Bosco taught their children just the same, out of pure friendship or for charity's sake. But the first lesson he taught them was to love God and obey his commandments, and he always ended the lesson by exhorting them to pray, avoid sin, and do God's will for them. Up to the time of his ordination as a priest, Giovanni Bosco climbed every day to the top of a hill covered with vineyards belonging to the Turco family. On top of the hill there was a grove of trees in whose shade Giovanni spent many hours. There he quietly pursued those supplementary studies for which he had no time during the scholastic year. In particular, history of the Old and New Testament and the geography of the Holy Land. He also studied Hebrew and became proficient in this language. In 1884, in Rome, to the great surprise of some Salesians, he was heard discussing the grammatical rules and meaning of certain phrases of the prophets with a priest who taught Hebrew. Together, they compared some parallel texts in different books of the Old Testament. He also became interested in the translation of the New Testament from the Greek and began to prepare some sermons basing himself on the original texts. Anticipating the need of modern foreign languages, he also began to study French, which was his favorite language besides Latin, Italian, Hebrew and Greek. Several times we heard him say, I pursued my studies in Giuseppe Turco's vineyard. This he did to prepare himself well for his mission of educating the young. Thank you for listening. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven together shall be. Always by the power of God's grace.